And welcome to tonight's edition of Fact Sheets live on ETV, also live on Facebook as well. Tonight, as we sit here, there's a very important conversation we would need to have as a nation, especially one which has to do with our health when we are thinking about COVID-19 and how to deal with it. Recently, we had some about 180,000 of vaccines that uh, people are being inoculated with by the Ghana Health Service. That's good news, that's refreshing news. And so all of us are striving very hard and the enthusiasm and the passion with which people want to get their jobs is very encouraging. Whilst we prepare ourselves to get more jobs uh, to try and get herd immunity, there's a concern that is also lingering. And that concern has to do with an alert that the Ghana Health Service issued somewhere last week. And that has to do with the alert that some neighboring countries have gotten cases of Marbeck virus and that of Ebola as well. What really is the Marbeck virus? What is Ebola as well? We have heard the world over how Ebola is and how dangerous it can be. But we are also being told that the Marbeck virus is as dangerous as Ebola with almost about 90%, you know, uh, deadliness when it comes to its ability to kill. And so tonight we'll try to understand what it would mean for us as a nation if you're dealing with COVID-19, if you're dealing with Ebola, and we're dealing with Marbeck at the same time. The measures that are being put in place to ensure we don't experience or have a case of any of these viruses in our country. If we do, what are the systems that are in place to ensure it doesn't become a matter of concern. We'll try to understand the symptoms, the signs that we should all be looking out for. And would the regular washing of hands and using of hand sanitizer suffice when it comes to combating this disease? That's our focus tonight on Fact Sheets. I encourage you to stay with us as we delve deeper into this matter to have a better appreciation of what the Marbeck virus is all about. Stay with us. All right, so All right, welcome, so welcome back, back to, to Fact Sheets, Sheets live, live on ETV, TV, live, live on Facebook, on. Twitter, and Instagram as well. Tonight, we are talking about the Marbeck virus and then Ebola virus with COVID-19 still here with us as a nation with a few vaccines coming through and the battle to get herd immunity is still raging on. My name is Samuel Shen and it's a pleasure to have you tonight on the show. So the Ghana Health Service hinted and alerted the nation about the fact that Ivory Coast and Guinea had recorded cases of Ebola and Marbeck virus. I remember checking on the website of the World Health Organization, the Africa one, and then it, the information was also there that some of these cases had been reported. But what it really means, we really don't have a full understanding. If we are supp supposed to be dealing with the Marbeck virus, Ebola and COVID-19 at the same time, the first time when Ghana was fighting Ebola, 2014-2015 uh, thereabout, though we did not record any case, certain measures had been put in place to ensure we never recorded any case. Now, these measures, can they be effective at this time when we have COVID-19 here with us? These are areas we shall concern ourselves with tonight, even as we look at the Marbeck virus and then the Ebola virus as well. We will try to understand the signs and symptoms. We will try to understand the incubation period for this disease. And within that time frame, if somebody is to enter into our nation, what happens? All these are issues by the time we are done with tonight's show, we would be able to address. And my guests are on standby for us to look at uh, these issues. And tonight, I will be joined by Dr. Kofi uh, Boni. Now, uh, he works with Noguchi. And uh, we'll be speaking to him via Zoom, and he will try to explain what this virus is. We'll also uh, be speaking to Dr. Peter Kujokwashi, who is a senior uh, research fellow with WACBIP. We'll speak, be speaking to him as well on the show tonight. But we have uh, Dr. Kofi Boni uh, online via Zoom uh, to begin the conversation with him. Doc, good evening, and welcome to Fact Sheet. Thanks for the opportunity. 
Doc, 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 let's, let's begin, begin by, by trying to understand what the Marbeck virus is. What really is it? Right. So, uh, Marbeck virus, um, as the name suggests, uh, was actually first detected in the city Marburg in Germany. Uh, they, they, they sent some monkeys, that's in the 1960s. Uh, some monkeys were supposed to be used for experiments. So these monkeys were, were shipped from Africa to Marburg. But then when they got there, they realized that they were having some fatalities. People, they, these monkeys were dying. Uh, they investigated and they detected this virus. And usually for viruses, they are named after places that they first detect them. So it was named Marble. Basically, it is a virus uh, that causes what we call the hemorrhagic fevers. And because it's a virus and causes hemorrhagic fevers, it's a viral hemorrhagic fever uh, uh, condition. Uh, in, when we talk about hemorrhagic fevers, what we mean is that the main symptoms that one will have after the initial symptoms that which is general like to like symptoms if the person progresses the person will hemorrhage that is there will be bleeding diathesis so the person will bleed from all orifices that is it can come through your your tears can be blood your it can come from your ears your mouth and all that that is the hemorrhage mm -hmm. and if you see Fever. fever normally you spike in temperature your temperature will go up so these are viruses that causes those conditions mainly they affect most organs in the body and when they get the blood clotting factors stopped and you can bleed to death when you get to that stage in in the infection that is towards the end stages but the initial symptoms are normally the flu-like symptoms you may have your body temperature going up. You may have body pains. You may sometimes have diarrhea. You can have uh, joint pains and all that. Those ones are normal symptoms that are associated with most of the endemic conditions we have. It can be malaria, it can be typhoid, or any other viral condition. But when one progresses, then you get into the hemorrhagic stage. That is, you have bloody conditions. You have blood coming from your nose, you can have blood vomitus. When you vomit, it will be bloody and all that. Mm -hmm. So it just, it, it's just closer to Ebola. In actual fact, it belongs to the family of viruses. We call them filoviruses. And we have only two, Ebola and Marburg. They are in that family. So it shares a lot of similarities with Ebola. And so that is what I can say for now with the virus. Maybe as we go along, uh, we'll, we'll get to get to know more about this virus. Uh, I believe, uh, I it, believe would be it would be appropriate, appropriate if we have, if we have an, understanding an understanding of, you know, the mode of transmission uh, as to how one contracts this disease. Can you tell us much more about the mode of transmission? Yes, right. That it mimics Ebola in so many ways. And as we know, I mean, if we can recall, when we had this West African epidemic, that is 2014 to 2016, we, we, we learned a lot about Ebola. So basically an infected person can infect another person who is not infected through bodily fluids. So if one comes into contact with the bodily fluid of an infected person, and there's any opening in that person who has come into contact with this body fluid, then the person has become exposed. And there's a fine line between exposure and infection. If you become exposed, then there are chances that you are going to get infected. In other words, if somebody is infected and any of the blood or bodily fluid from the person gets into you, the person who is not infected, or you become you come into contact with it. And this blood manages to get into your system. Then you also stand the chance of getting the infection. So mainly it's through bodily fluids. The others will come along. We can say that how do hospital staff 
or health staff get infected, even though they are wearing the full personal protective equipment and all that. You know, we wear them and sometimes wearing them is one thing and taking them off is another thing. You can get them contaminated without you even knowing it. If we have these virus-like particles in them, you may not see them. So touching them and maybe touching the corner of your eye, maybe unconsciously and all that, you can introduce those things. So these are the ways that health staff can also get themselves contaminated or infected when they are dealing with people who have gotten the infection. But it's truly through bodily fluids. That is how come one can get uh, the, the infection. All right, All now, right. now let's talk about the incubation period that for instance uh, I had gone out today I had made contact with somebody within what period would I be showing signs and symptoms of contracting the disease and within the period of incubation is it possible for me to also transmit as well how about those filoviruses the Ebola and also the marble we talk about two to like 21 days. In other words, it can go as far as three weeks for us to, I mean, the range, that's the incubation period. So somebody can get exposed today and get infection today, but it will take as long as three weeks for the person to start showing symptoms. That is incubation period. Somebody on the other hand can take about 10 days. Somebody can take a shorter time. It all depends on the individual and how immunocompetent we are. Right. So that is the, uh, the, uh, the duration or the, the incubation period. So it ranges from two to 21 days. And what that means is that, like the scenario you were trying to paint, if somebody gets into contact with somebody who is infected, the person at, the, at that particular moment or for some time may not show any symptoms. What that means is that the virus may be growing inside the person. The person may be incubating the virus. So the person will go undetected from the time that he got the infection. He can travel around, can move from the source of the infection to another place. They will take temperature, they will do all that, nothing will be seen. So when it gets full blown, and start showing symptoms. So one person can move from country A, where he got the infection, to country B, stay there for some time before it will manifest as symptoms. And, and that person can now, maybe before they get to know what it is, people might have handled him. People might have come into contact physically with him. That's how come some of these conditions spread. Because initially you don't know what you are dealing with. So you certainly handle, you do that and all that. But before you come to know it, it may be too late. You have maybe also exposed yourself or got yourself contaminated. That is why when things happen like that and alerts are raised, normal people who even come to hospitals or PDs, we have to see them with full PP. Make sure because you don't know what you are dealing with at the time. So anytime we get rumors or we get confirmation of some of these cases in other parts of the world, then we have to be on a state of alert. Make sure that anybody that you are seeing as a health staff, you are pro properly protected. If you're not a health staff, you don't go near people that you're not sure what they are having. You have to call in the required or the requisite persons to come and attend to them. Now, now the problem, the problem is, is Distinguishing, distinguishing the you know Marburg from the normal flu or even now COVID-19 if it, it exhibits the same signs as some of these viruses or viral diseases that we are talking about how do we distinguish between the Marburg virus that of Ebola and COVID-19 as well when they all have similar uh, symptoms as well The disease conditions we have, they start with what we call the generalized flu-like symptoms. Uh, so 
if you want to know how you can distinguish, it's just by laboratory investigations. That is why we say that if you feel unwell in these times, the best thing you have to do is to make sure that you go to the hospital. It is there that your sample will be taken for laboratory investigation. It is only through laboratory investigations that we can tell you what you have. Yes, a clinician can suspect after examination, but he cannot pinpoint or tell you exactly what you have. So it has been investigated in the laboratory. That is, a clinical specimen has been taken from you and they have done the investigation in the laboratory. So for most of the disease conditions we have, especially the endemic ones, it starts initially with one having the flu-like symptoms. You have the body pains. Sometimes you have headache. Your temperature will go up. Those are very common. We talk about COVID is there. We talk about Ebola is there. We talk about Marburg is there. So the initial symptoms are just very similar, the generalized symptoms. But then you have to, because of what we have heard, because if you are dealing with these things, you talk about epidemiological links. Because of what we are heard or what we are hearing, the moment you have those conditions, you try to rule out some of these things. So it is only by laboratory investigations that you can get to rule out some of these uh, conditions. All right, let, All right, me, go let me go to the phone line. Speak, speak to Dr. Dr. Peter Kwashi and, and take, a take a few comments, comments from, from, him from him as to the conversation. But if you just join us, you're live on ETV live on Facebook as well, live on Nisim 95.9 and 100.1 in Bogatanga and Tamale respectively. We are talking about the Marburg virus and then we are talking about Ebola and we are talking about COVID-19 as well. They've got uh, uh, virtually the same similarities in terms of the signs and symptoms that they exhibit. And so we are trying to understand how we'll be able to distinguish and then also protect ourselves. Dr. Kwashi, good, good evening and uh, thanks so much for joining us. Good evening. All right, so when we started the conversation, Dr. Kofi Boni made the point about it being a hemorrhagic, uh, you know, disease where when it's at the advanced stage, you begin to experience these things and you have blood uh, coming through your nose and all your openings. Can you explain to us what these hemorrhage situations or conditions are? So I think uh, uh, Dr. Tony, this one is with you uh, explaining that. Um, hello? Hello? Yeah, Doc, I'm here with you. Yes, there, there seems to be some feedback. So um, I think that the Bonnie did a good job of explaining that. Well, the, one of the reasons they are called uh, hemorrhagic fevers is that you have the fever at the initial stage, and once the virus has replicated and there's a lot of virus in the system and it's infected a lot of organs, now you are going to have uh, bleeding from all your, a lot of your um, orifices, and that's uh, due to um weakening your blood your blood vessels. So your blood vessels which are near the surface, so maybe your eye, the mouth, all the epithelial layers will start to bleed. And that's where you see the physical manifestation. And if you are looking for a sign, that's how you differentiate between both Marburg and Dola from uh say COVID nineteen. But like you mentioned, the only way to differentiate those two is uh, by doing laboratory analysis. You know, one of the reasons why the first case of Ebola in, uh, in Guinea and a lot of those early cases were missed was because they weren't doing laboratory analysis. And even when they, they didn't expect Ebola, so they weren't screening for Ebola. So to be honest, it's, uh, the fact that they detected Ebola and the fact that they detected Marburg is actually, uh, it sounds uh, strange to say, but it's actually a good sign for the surveillance system. It means that the system is to the point that they detect 
a virus like Marburg, which you don't even expect to be in West Africa. I have never been observed in West Africa as far as I know. All right. Now, I remember when we had the Delta strain. The reason mm. why we're all concerned about the Delta strain has to do with how fast, you know, it transmits. I, in this yeah. regard, if we are comparing, how fast is the transmission rate of uh, the Marburg virus? Yes, yeah, so, so like, it's interesting. The, the reason why the Delta strain is, is, uh, is scary is somewhat different from the reason why the Marburg virus is scary. So with the coronavirus, because it's a respiratory virus, it can spread relatively fast. And with viruses, you know what, what we say, successful viruses. Successful viruses do not kill the host right away. So even with the Delta, it's not going to kill most people. So it's able to spread from person to person to person. And before some people die. But you notice that with Marburg, and at first with some of the early Ebola trends, they are not um, very successful viruses. They are too dangerous. So they kill the first few people that they uh, infect. And because of that, they don't stay in the system long enough to spread uh, a lot. Of mm. course, we have to... Uh, Put a caveat because Ebola used to be the same, but now we are seeing Ebola uh, not killing at the high rate. So because of that, it stays in the environment community long enough to start spreading. Uh, with Marburg, there hasn't been many reports of human uh, infection, and most of the cases have been one person, and that person has died and not being able to communicate. So right now, at the end of the days, we'll see how many people could have been infected by these cases. And um, yeah. All right, so when we started the conversation with uh, Dr. Kofi Boni, he made the point that, you know, some German scientists were working on some monkeys and then they realized, uh, you know, they mm -hmm. were dying and that's how come, you know, we got the Marburg virus. Now, mm -hmm. I have seen pieces of uh, works where mm -hmm. they also attribute this disease to bats as well. I yeah. also saw a piece which also talked about how we should be careful with pigs as well. Should we yeah. be careful about certain kinds of animals when we are dealing with the Marburg virus? Yes, with these uh, viruses, there's a... Uh, there's a good body of researchers that take and uh, a few other animals can be readily infected by them and that we can transmit uh, from pigs or from um, hominids to humans. So it's something that we should be wary of. And then again, uh, with Mumbek, unlike people, you know, we suspect Ebola is coming from that. But uh, as far as I know, we have never um, isolated a single Ebola virus from the past. Um, however, with Marburg, um, in a few instances, four length Marburg virus has been isolated from the bat, which really proves that the bats are. Um, at least one of the reservoirs. So, are we in danger? Because, for instance, uh, in my area, there are lots of fruits there that I sometimes do see bats. Uh, around the 37 <laughs> area, there, there are lots of bats there. Yes. Uh, are we in danger with these bats around? Is that to me or to Dr. It's to you, Dr. Kwashi. Okay. I wouldn't say we are in danger. I mean, it's like, we, we of course, I wouldn't advise uh, trying to push buttons and things like that. But like I said, um, in terms of 
how these uh, viruses tend to spread. Uh, as Dr. Kennedy said, it's through bodily fluids. And the community at large only becomes in danger when you have a large number of infected individuals. So, because there's one, um, one isolated case of Marburg virus, I think the risk to us in Ghana is relatively low. Because, uh, as I was explaining to a colleague of mine, it's not as easy to go from Guinea to Ghana as it is from, to go from Guinea to Cote d'Ivoire. Because there's no direct flight between us and Guinea. And the same protocols that we have at the airport to screen would actually um, tend to pick out some of these things. And Marburg, like Ebola, during the incubation period, unless it's the signs of change, during the incubation period, when you are not showing symptoms and you are not serious, the chance of you infecting someone was spread over. It's one of the signs that showing them that uh, you're infectious. So anybody who is coming in with a fever will be picked up at the airport. You know, Ebola is a bit. Uh, we have to worry a little bit more about Ebola because uh, the person who tested positive in Abidjan apparently walked across the border. That uh, was well, maybe not walked, but he crossed the land border from Guinea to Cote d'Ivoire. And we are imagine that person would have seen many people before they got to Abidjan. So that's something that I personally worry a little bit about. And I hope that they do the contact tracing very well to try to isolate all the contacts. Um, because we've seen that Ebola is now, um, because it's less deadly than the initial Ebola that was coming, it's now able to spread more. And so that's uh, something that's more worrying than Marburg. Even though Marburg has a 90% fatality rate, if you look at the history, you see that most of the outbreaks have been one person, two people, and so on and so forth. All right. So let's say somebody you know, begins to exhibit some signs and symptoms of the disease immediately. Uh, what should that person do? You know, that person should go um, to their health uh, center. Um, it, and if they suspect, I mean, I don't know how a lay person would suspect that, but if they suspect for any reason that they had exposure to Marburg or Ebola, I think the first thing they should do is invite um, the medical staff in that so that they'll be treated uh, with the appropriate level of PPE. One, uh, I guess, uh, hidden benefit to us being in COVID right now is that the medical staff are already in PPE that would um, protect them against uh, these viruses. But of course, Unlike COVID, they would also have to be careful about touching the patient. You know, mm -hmm. with uh, COVID-19, the you don't have to worry so much about touching the patient. But with Ebola uh, and with Marburg, where it's spread through bodily fluids, you can if the person is very infectious, you can get it by touching. Uh, uh, through the sweat and uh, so the first thing would be to advise the health that uh, health professionals that oh, I have been exposed to somebody with mother. Of course, those administer a questionnaire and ask some questions to see if it, there's a chance of that, and then they would have to take samples, which would then be processed to. Um, use a molecular assay to determine whether you've been infected or not. All right. Uh, let me go to Dr. Kofi Boni and ask a question which has to do with, uh, you know, prevention. At least now we know 
that uh, you know it's here with us uh, how do we protect ourselves if we are not supposed to come into contact with people families are home with their loved ones their children wife and husband boyfriend and girlfriend how do we protect ourselves what are the steps we ought to be taking yeah so uh, like i indicated earlier uh, you have to be careful if you have somebody who is unwell uh, especially if you are handling the person. Uh, because, like I said, it is only after laboratory investigations that you can confirm whether the person has got it or not. So you can only protect yourself uh, by not handling people who are not, who are not well. If you want to do so, wear the appropriate uh, call the equipment, the personal protective equipment. For the health staff, they have to make sure that they gown up. Even attending to OPD, people who are just coming for outpatient, or come to outpatient department. But for us, we have to be very mindful. If somebody is not well, we don't have to pretend to be medics and be attending to them. That is one. We have talked about hand washing. Hand washing is is one of the key interventions that when we use most of the time, we save ourselves from getting into contact with some of these viral agents. We should wash our hands regularly or frequently with soap and the running water. Uh, for Ebola or Marburg, we talk about sanitizing or general bodily hygiene. Hand sanitizing is also okay, but you know, we use what we call the 70% alcohol-based, at least, sanitizes. Because if, if it is a virus, that is, can, that is what can easily inactivate the virus. So we talk about these uh, measures, hand washing, hand sanitizing, not going close or touching people that they are unwell, that we are not sure what it is. If we talk about COVID, you know, some of the telltale signs are very simple. Somebody may be coughing or sneezing and all that. Even now, we have got to know that there are some of the symptoms that we didn't know before. Now it's showing up with the Delta variant that we have. So the key thing is that if somebody is unwell, I think we should seek proper medical attention. And we shouldn't be going close and all that. Especially, or, or can also talk about touching dead bodies and all that. That also we should be very careful of. Because sometimes we don't know what killed the person. The idea is that when you touch, touch things, you, you, you may forget to wash your hands. And you'll be touching other parts of your body, especially your face. When there are so many openings in your face, you have your nostrils there, we have your eyelashes there, we have your mouth there. So you can introduce things into your body without you knowing it or unknowingly, and that can cause problems. So yes, we can only prevent ourselves by making sure that those who are sick seek proper medical attention, and it should be as early as possible, and we shouldn't be touching and all that. And apart from that, we should practice hand hygiene, hand hygiene as, as, as often as we can. That is also very important the point about how it is possible for the same tests uh, we are running at our points of entry for instance at the airport being able uh, to detect the Marbeck virus can you throw more light on that aspect for me in uh, all that they have to do is that we are now doing for COVID they are using an assay that they can also use a similar assay to test for COVID, uh, sorry, for the marble. In other words, they have to change some aspects of maybe the assay that they are using and adapt it to doing the test for, uh, for marble. But you see, what is important here is that the initial screening is key, the initial screening. So you have entered the airport, they will take your temperature. <clears throat> Temperature, as I said initially, we are talking about viral hemorrhagic fever, fever. Okay? So if the temperature spikes, it tells us something. So you'll be held in a room 
when they take a temperature that is above normal. And whilst you are held there, they will interrogate, they will ask you questions, then take some clinical samples from you for further investigations before they will allow you to join everybody else, if they rule out all of this. So that point is very important. But yes, it's true, we miss out because of what we discussed earlier on, the incubation period. Yes, somebody may go through all these screening tests and you pass, but may be carrying the virus because it has not gotten to a stage where it will manifest as symptoms. And we have to note that for Marburg or Ebola, it is not like COVID where we can have asymptomatics that you are not showing symptoms, but you can still spread. For Marburg, you have to show symptoms before you can, you can, you can. And one of the symptoms, clear symptoms is the fever. So if they take, they screen you at the airport and they realize that your temperature is above normal, they have a holding room where you'll be held there. They will take clinical samples for further investigations. And so that is what is going to be done to make more or less, maybe stop, or prevent people who are infected from entering the country. So that, that's one thing. Yes, we can have people going through because they are not showing the symptoms at the time. But then we should be careful as all of us, we should be careful. If we see somebody showing unusual signs or is feeling unwell, I think we should resort to the health center as soon as we can. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Let's look at the possibility of treating the virus. Now, COVID-19 COVID that we have a vaccine for the Marburg virus, do we have any form of treatment for this disease? Uh, no, uh, for most of these, we call them uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers. Uh, we have a technique we call the supportive treatment or therapy, supportive. In other words, when they take you, because they don't have a medication to treat, or to manage the virus itself. They treat what we call the symptoms. That's why they say go to the hospital early. So when you get there early and you have headache, they will give you medication to take care of the headache. Mm -hmm. They will make sure that the fever you have calms down. So they treat the symptoms. And when they do that, then the body becomes stronger immune-wise to fight against the virus. Because it's the body alone that can produce what we call the neutralizing antibodies to fight the virus. So you treat the symptoms for the body to become stronger for it to fight the virus. So that is what is called the supportive treatment. So we don't have a specific vaccine or medication for the virus or for this condition, but they do what we call the therapeutic uh, supportive therapy or supportive treatment to take care of it. So right. the Go you for a short break when we come back, then we will take a look at the measures that the Ghana Health Service is putting in place to ensure that we don't record even a case in the country. And if we do record a case, what we ought to do as a nation, do kindly stay with us. And you welcome back to Fact Sheets live on ETV, live on Facebook as well, and live on Nissim 95.9. And we are talking about the outbreak of Marbeck virus and Ebola in countries around us and the preparedness of our nation, our health care officers, you know, to fight this disease if we should have an outbreak in the country. And I'm on the line with Dr. Kwashi and then also Dr. Kofi Boni from Noguchi. Now, let me come to Dr. Kwashi for uh, the question about our preparedness and the steps we ought to be taking now as a country to avoid even recording a case as we did in the past. Okay. I don't uh, know the specific level of preparedness we have now with my bank. I would imagine that uh, I think Dr. Bunny would uh, be able to answer that question. Um, but I would imagine that we are adapting the assets that we have already for Ebola, uh, for Marburg. So they just need uh, to get the 
uh, slight different, slightly different priming. Um, for Ebola, we already had to set up uh, in preparation from 2014. So um, I think what needs to be beefed up is uh, the airport screening. I think that uh, the temperature screening at the airport was, uh, was relaxed a little bit because we saw that during COVID, uh, a lot of positive cases weren't necessarily having temperature. And uh, recently when I traveled, I didn't see a huge uh, focus on temperature screening. So I think that's something that needs to be uh, enhanced even more. Um, and uh, then, of course, strengthening the laboratory response. I think, again, because the protocols were put in place for Ebola, that it should be fairly straightforward to be to put them in place for Marburg. And then now all the isolation centers have been uh, are COVID isolation centers. So we need to uh, think of um, putting aside uh, Marburg slash Ebola isolation centers because those are uh, a different level of danger. They pose a different level of danger. So you even need uh, maybe a slightly higher level of isolation, um, especially for the patient to the health practitioner, because now there's a real danger from contact between uh, the doctor and the patient. So whereas uh, with Ebola, you could get them with uh, COVID, you're wearing the mask and the gown and, and gloves, and that's usually fine with uh, both Ebola and Marburg, you'd likely have to wear the hazmat suit and as much as possible try to completely cut off uh, contact between the skin and the, and any bodily fluids from the patients. All right, now I remember at the time when, you know, there was a rumor of uh, COVID-19 at one of our referral hospitals in this country. There were rumors of doctors running away. In, in that respect, what would you expect that the Ghana Health Service does in terms of preparing our medical doctors for uh, this disease? Well, I, I would uh, it's that Dr. Bonnie? No, th that's for you, Dr. Kwasi. Okay, I would expect that they would uh, uh, give slightly enhanced uh, training and uh, information to the medical staff. I think what happened with uh, the early outbreak of COVID-19 is that people were really scared and there was not that much information. So um, information sharing would be really beneficial um, because uh, doctors, nurses, they're all human. And, uh, Nobody wants to die. So when there's a new disease uh, and people are afraid of what that means and they don't have any information, then that's sort of the inevitable uh, outcome. So basically, Ghana Health Service should, uh, on these fronts, provide more information to the staff. Also set aside, like I mentioned, dedicated isolation centers um, because I suspect all the isolation centers have been closed for COVID. Um, we need separate ones. And then uh, strengthen the laboratory capacity to detect these uh, viruses. All right. I thank you, Dr. Kwashi. Let me quickly pick uh, the wrap up comments from Dr. Boni. And that has to do with one of the steps that we saw. Uh, some nations take at the time that they had recorded cases of COVID-19 and that was preventing people uh, from coming from areas where cases have been recorded. In this respect, would you expect that the Ghana Health Service uh, uh, through the government would ensure that people coming from uh, affected areas like Guinea do not enter uh, into our country? Uh, well, those, those decisions are high-level decisions that the government has to take uh, considering so many factors. Uh, I would say that 
is early days. Uh, the screening is important. The, if you talk about Marburg, I mean, containing the virus is easier uh, than talking about COVID because of the mode of transmission. If you have an index case, or if you have the first few cases, you're able to, con to make sure that you isolate them. You isolate them, then that means you stop the spread. That is the first thing. Just make sure that these people have been quarantined. That's all. That means stop the spread. But it is not like COVID, where it's sometimes it's aerosol or airborne or maybe droplet infection. So that's where the difficulty is. But for Marburg, if we are able to have had some few cases, let these people be quarantined or isolated, then you are curtailing the spread. Then you can let economic activities still go on because see, stopping people from coming to your country has its own implications. You see, so I think at this point or at this at this stage, we say we can say there's early days, but the government or people advising the government will wait, we possibly wait to see how things pan out. If it becomes necessary, I think they will come out with measures to control traffic from areas where we have a, a higher number of infected cases. Uh, making sure that to your country, I mean, it's also, put, uh, you have put the necessary uh, preparatory measures there for people to maybe protect themselves. So for now, I can say that this early days. Doc, we will thank you for making time. time. Join us tonight on Fact Sheet. Uh, I'll thank you, Dr. Kofi Boni with Noguchi and then Dr. Peter Kwashi with Wabib. I'm grateful that you made time to join us tonight for us to have an understanding of what the Marburg disease is or the virus is, Ebola, and then dealing with COVID-19 as well. I'm grateful to you as well for watching us from your homes. Uh, Girl Vibes is up next tomorrow, God willing, there'll be a repeat broadcast of the show live on ETV at 10. But I'm grateful once again for making time to join us. My name is Samuel Shen, and I encourage you to join the Happy Morning Show tomorrow at 5.30 a.m. Good night.